I'm Jen Burns. Um, I am Managing Director of Business Intelligence and Revenue Enablement at Interfolio. I'm guilty of throwing technology at problems too quickly. Um, and I think I've learned the hard way that that's actually not the right way to do it. Where we statistically measured everything. And all we wound up doing was becoming so focused on, on the statistics that we totally lost sight of what was our objective. Britton Manasco, I am the founder and CEO of Visible Impact in Austin, Texas, and the author with my uh, co-author, Annika Celios, of the new book, Next Era Selling. And I would call it the distinction between the, the message to market and the message in market. The biggest challenge I see today from sales enablement is, it's one of the biggest challenges, the content perspective. Sales doesn't know where to find the content. Welcome to our webcast, uh, Sales Enablement Society Best Practices. Why don't we start with, with Jen? You know that messaging is important and the sales readiness process is, uh, is sketchy in many companies. Can you tell us a little bit about how it works in your company? Let me preface by saying that one of the most challenging aspects of successfully executing sales readiness and messaging is a misalignment between marketing and sales. Um, and I can proudly say that <clears throat> in our organization, we have a very, very strongly tied um, and aligned sales and marketing organization. And so we do drive a lot of efficiency to the process just naturally by having that level of alignment. But our marketing organization works very closely with sales enablement um, to ensure that you know we are executing on um, our market strategy through the messaging, which is, you know, obviously done through a lot of content generation um, uh, through the marketing team. Um, and then that, you know, of course, fuels the, the readiness piece to ensure that our sales enablement team is successfully um, not only providing that content when and where the sellers need it, training them on it, but also ensuring, you know, that they are executing that message effectively through um, you know, sales conversations, so our SDR team doing outreach into the market um, through our demonstrations, and then obviously as we continue um, through the sales cycle and having uh, senior level executive conversations with the stakeholders that, you know, essentially are our buyers in the process. Britton, what's, um, what, what's your perspective? One thing we, we observed in our, our research is that um, when a new product is developed and being rolled out, uh, product marketing often gets a bill of materials and they have to go out and create a number of assets and, and arm the sales force, if you will. But the problem is, as the research suggests uh, from the uh, American Marketing Association, 90% of the content that marketing creates for sales does not get used by sales. It's a, <laughs> it's a massive problem. And it's getting created and then, and then not adopted, I think, right to your question, uh, Gerhard, about ensuring buy-in. And I think part of the problem is it's not about the quality of the content necessarily, although often the content is very much, the message is very much uh, product-centric or, or uh, the seller as hero on the hero's journey, as opposed to the buyer being the hero. Um, some of those issues come into play with the content and the message themselves, but I'd say there's a, a bigger structural problem that gets magnified as the enterprise gets larger, and it's this. It's that uh, sales and marketing are in silos, and Jen, I think you, you spoke to that challenge there. They are in silos and, and, and tend to respect the ones that are in their tribe most. And, and are a little suspicious of anything coming over the transom at them. And so the question is, how at the outset, when you're developing the story, you're developing the messaging and the content, do you ha drive consensus, buy-in, and, and, and adoption so that sales feels like it's, it's got ownership of this and it had a, it had a part in creating it? And, and also that the voice of the customer was incorporated in it because that's really what validates it. So that's what we found in our, our research on the value story supply chain and its breakdown at this point. And um, that's, that's what we're seeing. The 90% of marketing material that's not used by salespeople is a lot of wasted productivity. So the question is, how do you harness that productivity? 
Walter, do you have anything to share on that subject? Yes. Um, I have a tendency to work backwards. So when I say that, I focus a lot initially on sales and work from the perspective, what is the sales story? What is the core problem of the client? And where you can get buy-in from sales and then align it with marketing. And it can be done from a variety of perspectives. You can put service level agreements together where they have come together of common goals and objectives, but really where you're bringing marketing and sales to the table and you've already gotten buy-in from sales because that's the key component to this. So if you can get sales on board and get the right messaging components that marketing can build upon and have a better understanding of sales core challenges and their core, core storylines, it's vitally important. And then that can be integrated into the content. So when marketing provides sales that content, they have the buy-in and there's more value involved if they create the content in the manner where it's cataloged correctly, where sales can easily access and find that core message. Let, let me put this into a different perspective because at one time I sat on mark, I was in marketing, I've been in sales and, and sales planning, sales marketing, channel management, et cetera. And I think one of the big reasons why 90% of all marketing material never gets used, and I totally buy into that, is because marketing is challenged with creating content for virtually every situation out there. And the salesperson ultimately says, I only need this and I only need this and I only need this. The other piece is that marketing people are charged with, if I don't equip the salespeople, I can get fired. So therefore they're gonna over emphasize all the material and all the tools and all the FAQs and everything that they put out. So you put those two combinations together and it's naturally that there's gonna be 90% that gets wasted. Now, can we reduce that number? Sure we can, but I don't think we'll ever get that down to minimally less than 50%. Because really, if you think about it, my needs are gonna be different than everyone else's needs out there. So I will always choose to use different content than what somebody else might. That's just the way it is. You know, in order to understand what the sales team is using, um, kind of to my earlier point, you need to put up a, a structure or a foundation to, un, to, to track that, to understand what it is they are using, but not just what they're using, how the, um, the prospect or customer is actually engaging with that content. Um, and that's really been driving a lot of value in our organization because we're understanding the utilization from a seller perspective, making sure that, that there's a connection there, but also that the customer is engaging with that content as well. And that's driving um, quite a bit of insight and value into this entire process. And I think feeds into, you know, how we're ensuring that sales enablement is correctly, um, you know, able to position this role effectively in the organization, which is not only the tie between the two uh, teams, the sales and the marketing team, but obviously having the visibility into, you know, what types of systems or processes can we put in place to ensure that, all the things everyone just described is, is actually possible, trackable, and then using that information to better inform how we strategize moving forward from a messaging standpoint, content, what have you. Great points. I, can, I wanna just respond to all of them uh, in turn. So um, Walter made a really great point about working backward from sales, which I think is really interesting, but there is sort of something to think about. And I would call it the distinction between the, the message to market and the message in market. So the message to market means we're, we're developing something new and we have to create new messages and, and go out and, 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 you know, we have to speculate to some extent what's going to resonate, what's not. Um, and, and, and that's very marketing driven. I mean, it kind of goes, you know, goes uh, downstream from product to product marketing and marketing to sales to the customer. That's sort of the chain. But then once it's in market, then, then we're starting to get feedback on what's working and what isn't working. And, um, and that's when we can start refining the content if we're dealing with this in a very agile fashion, as opposed to what I've, I've seen as sort of this waterfall approach where we're going to put a lot of thought into the content up front and, and then we're going to throw it out there and, and really not do anything much afterwards. It's just sales is problem to figure it out. So that's kind of a, a distinction I see. And, and 
to to uh, Jen's Jen's point. I'll come back to Mark's, but um, of of getting the data and the analysis. I think that's where the platforms and technologies that enable us to collect this data and 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 keep the data. And by the way, keep the content in a place where it's centrally accessible. That would be the sales content management systems and learning management systems. And so there's great innovations happening along those lines that would give. Uh, a, a great data-driven decision maker like Jen Burns, the, the, the insights she needs to make great decisions. And, and finally, I'll just come to Mark because um, this point about uh, marketing trying to create content for everyone, this is part of the problem, I, and I've written about this. I call it, um, well, it's kind of like marketing wants to, if you think of a, an x-axis with personas and, and a y-axis, with buying stages, they've got to fill that whole grid out with different pieces, different assets, and, and it can be paralyzing. So we call that the content grid, and we call the outcome content gridlock. And if you multiply that by one more axis, uh, you know, perhaps verticals, you know, suddenly you've got a content cube. And so this is a terrible arrangement that I think uh, content marketers have, have encouraged us to all embrace, but what's missing in that whole equation is the voice of sales and often the voice of the customer. The role of a sales enablement manager uh, needs to be the, uh, as we discussed in our former uh, broadcast, uh, there need to be silo busters. I think sales enablement professionals are in that in that position, and um, but you know, in, in lots of cases, they need to be augmented by third parties that can come in and facilitate uh, uh, the, the interactions between distinct parties. I think it's vitally important. The one challenge we run into a great deal is that looking at from a marketing and sales perspective, that alignment perspective, what we've been talking about, is where really, again, bringing sales to the table, to the conversation really early on. And that's not only sales management, but the sales reps. And really getting, because a lot of times marketing doesn't really always understand the personas as well as they think they do. And sales knows the personas better than anyone. Also, the core problems and the challenges that the clients have. And really work backwards from that to create the content and the messaging around the problems. And then create the, from the messaging, the actual content that can be aligned for sales to effectively use. Because if you do that, there's a better opportunity to get buy-in from sales to effectively use the content. And just to expand on this, the biggest challenge I see today from sales enablement is, it's one of the biggest challenges is the content perspective. Sales doesn't know where to find the content. Their challenge, they don't even know the content exists. There's too much content. So if you manage to put a process and system together, working backwards from sales and creating content effectively, then cataloging effectively, and having a sales enablement solution where they know to go find that content that's going to be valuable to them. It's invaluable. And that content's not only front-facing content to the client, but it's also the educational component. The, not only the onboarding, but the ongoing training component content that's going to provide value to sales based upon the knowledge of the customer. So, um, Jen, what, what's your take on, on balancing the... Uh, the sales enablement job with a with a customer enablement tool. The customer piece, to me, it's it's kind of looking at the entire life cycle, right? Because you know we're we're very focused kind of on the front end of the process with sales organization, and you know the the front facing, um, you know, boots on the street, feet on the street, sales guys. But there's also the the content on the back end, which is current customer facing, right? and how to understand you know, the feedback that we're getting from current customers, leveraging the feedback we're getting from uh, prospective customers, and really trying to drive the strategy from both of those things. And so where I think, and I know I'm kind of diverting just a little bit here, but where I think sales enablement really is able to drive value to the sales organization and the marketing organization is being engaged across the entire customer life cycle. Um, so one, one of the biggest I think goals from my perspective in sales enablement is to ensure that the role um, does have intersection, not only between sales and marketing, but customer success. Because without that component built into your overarching enablement strategy, 
um, you know, you don't really have visibility into the whole picture. And so um, from my standpoint, the customer enablement piece is all encompassing across the journey of, of the customer from when they're a prospect to when, you know, they're a partner of the organization. Um, and so that enables you know, sales enablement, no pun, to really, I think, drive value to this approach, um, particularly as it relates to content um, and ensuring that, you know, we have um, visibility into how customers view us um, in the marketplace, not only as a customer, but as a prospect as well. And, um, you know, from my standpoint, that's where you're able to really drive some, some value as a sales enabler. This is a fascinating discussion because we can get all the customer feedback we want but we have to make sure it's statistically viable because when we deal with just one customer, we get one customer's opinion. And that's so many times what I saw happen when I was in a role of director of sales is that salesperson would come to me and they've got this customer's perspective and this is what they want for marketing. Well, that's that person. And we have to, and I think Britton said, good, good point. We have to truly be the, the silo busters like we talked about last week. And it really begs the bigger question. Does marketing, belong under the sales umbrella. And I think in many, many organizations where it is a customer facing sale, we have to have marketing reporting into sales being much more closely aligned with sales than it traditionally is in way too many companies. So what you're saying is if you don't have that sales and marketing alignment, you're not gonna have the message alignment, you don't have the company speak with one voice and, and uh, the voice of the customer comes uh, in, uh, you know, flows inconsistently throughout the organization and the company does not receive that and doesn't analyze it or respond to it in a timely fashion. Yeah. And you know what? Let, let, let's touch on one bigger piece, KPIs. What are each person's KPIs? Because if you think about it, the marketing person's KPIs and the salesperson's KPIs, they're dramatically different. And until we really start aligning the whole KPI process, all the way through and truly making it customer focused, I don't think we'll ever be able to truly break down these respective silos. I just think that's such a great point that Mark made is, uh, I, I call it the, the tyranny of minimal data points. It's like a, a few customers can, in, can set us off in full directions and anecdotes become uh, um, oppressive in that sense. They just, they just take us in the wrong direction. And we just have to be very aware of some of the factors in play, you know, I mean, what, what's the quantity of, of, of customer data we're getting? What's the quality of it? Uh, and what's the maturity? You know, this gets back to, are we going to market or are we in market? Is this a new offering? Is this a mature offering? Because I think customer feedback uh, plays a different role in those different uh, situations. And, and we have to, uh, we have to, uh, you know, calculate and consider these matters. Otherwise, we end up with the Henry Ford problem that, he, you know, the faster horse problem. If I would have asked my customers what they wanted, this was, you know, prior to the Model T, they would have said a faster horse. That is definitely a, a distinct issue in this issue, in this era of disruptive and new innovations. They don't know what they don't know. So their feedback needs to be considered with that in mind and they need to be observed and so forth. But in, in terms of answering a, a survey and telling you what you need to build, that to me is, is something I'm, I'm very cautious about. And, and I'm, uh, I'm we, have a, we have an audience question um, and I, I want to submit it to anybody. Uh, Anthony Lewis asks, um, after, after you have the core messaging and alignment, can you give me some examples on how you quantify whether reps are prepared or not? I'll jump in and say that it's really measured by whether or not sales are being closed. You know, I really get, really rubs me the wrong way when we put in all these benchmark statistics and all you're really doing is creating smiley sheets and check-ins and so forth. It really comes down to, is that sale getting closed? Is that, isn't that too limiting, just yes. one metric? Well, so you're right, it is limiting. Yeah. But my, my concern is I've seen organizations, and I was part of one for years, where we statistically measured everything. And all we wound up doing was becoming so focused on, on the statistics that we totally lost sight of what was our objective? What was our objective? So that's where I, I kind of pushed to the opposite extreme. I, I, uh, I agree with Mark that, um, that 
essentially the, this is a critical indicator is, is does, does the business close and, and how do they perform relative to quota and so forth and impact this has on that. I would say that strikes me as kind of a lagging indicator and that we also need to have leading indicators and, and things like um, how, how much are they consuming this? Um, if we've got a, a presentation or a point of view, an insight driven point of view, we want the sales to, to bring to market. Are they, and, and this is what the, these sales content management systems enable is for them to uh, go on and, and film themselves giving the pitch or giving the, their point of view. That's them doing that and doing that well is a leading indicator that, that we're having an impact in terms of creating story, message, content that matters. Um, it's, it's, it's not the only, it, 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 we just have to factor in leading and lagging indicators is my point. Jen. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting you say that because that's exactly the direction that I was going in. And I think to Mark's earlier point about KPIs, it's, it's very, Hard, like it's it's amazing to me that in all the organizations I work for, um, sales and marketing KPIs have never been aligned, um, and I think it's a very simple thing to do. And and Britain exactly like the leading and, and lagging indicator mix is key here because you need to be able to have your marketing and sales funnel completely aligned all the way down, so you understand what marketing leads are leading to close business, what sales leads are leading to close business. Um, and what that, you know, flow looks like through, but what's in between is often missing, which is what behaviors, what content, what processes are actually leading to those successes in addition to, um, you know, your more generic, you know, KPIs that are giving you insight. And so it's not difficult to set these things up. Um, in fact, you know, from my perspective, you know, it's, it's very much so like, what is the process? And then go configure that in your systems to be able to give you those outputs. Because we talk a lot about, you know, all these systems and systems are great. And I love all of them. But if you don't have the right foundation in place to support those systems, it's a moot point, right? And I think not to go in the direction of the technology conversation, but we are all overwhelmed right now, um, especially practitioners in all of the technology systems that are available. Um, and, and it becomes complicated and confusing to understand which is going to help you actually execute all the things that we're talking about today. And I think if we can figure out what good looks like from a process standpoint and like what are the things we actually want to track, if we can as a group collectively understand what those are, I think that is the key first. And then it's, okay, how, what kind of technology do we need to actually go and execute that and deliver you know, the, the data elements that we need to make our decisions moving forward. I, you know, I'm guilty of throwing technology at problems too quickly. Um, and I think I've learned the hard way that that's actually not the right way to do it. Um, but I think if we figure out what those KPIs are, what the leading and lagging indicators need to be, then we can back end into the technology piece of the strategy. We heard about content gridlock. Uh, do you think that we approach mm -hmm. Technology gridlock? Yeah, I do. Um, I, I think someone had published recently, and I can't remember who it was, a map of all of the sales enablement vendors out there. Um, uh, candidly, I do use a couple platforms outside of Salesforce that help us drive efficiency, learn you know, what our content efficacy is. So those things I am using, but it is it is overwhelming as um, a practitioner to understand what value they all bring. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's becoming a little bit diluted, so much so that I've actually gone back to the basics in a lot of ways to, to kind of start over and rebuild my sales process and rebuild my KPI framework and, you know, before I start leveraging technology. Britton, how do you use that platform? This has been recently launched and there are a few groups uh, um, that have been very active. I'd love to hear Walter weigh in on this. So let me just, just be brief. And I, I'd say one of the most active groups has been focused on the definition projects. But um, once, once you are part of the society um, and, and you, are, you're at, you have access to this content, and it's going to be a way, and this is powerful, this is going to be a way to drive peer-driven uh, research findings capture best practices uh, and, and house them and, and begin to 
build a you know social network around them. Uh, and this is real world. This is what people are experiencing, good, bad, and ugly. And I think that's what's so powerful about it. Uh, it's, it's real world practitioners weighing in, and we're just getting started on that front. But it's an amazingly powerful aspect of what's valuable about being connected to the Sales Enablement Society. So while, while we are talking, Walter, can you pull up the uh, Sales Enablement Society platform and, and show us how you've used it? But uh, uh, Sure. Get ready for that. Uh, uh, Mark, have you been on the website? Yes, I have. I was out on the website after our call this last week, and then I've received a couple of the updates from it. And, uh, and I tell you what, it's absolutely fascinating information to be reading. It's been phenomenal. Um, so I use it uh, pretty extensively in managing some of the groups or communities like the DC chapter and the SMB group. Um, and it's really provided a way for us to collaborate uh, off of kind of social media, which is where a lot of this started. And it's difficult to track and, you know, monitor a lot of the communications going back and forth. So I would say it's a necessity for all of us to be communicating via that platform. But it also is, I think, at the beginning of what we're trying to accomplish, which is, you know, how do we really share amongst each other in an effective way? Um, and it's, it's categorized in such a way that it's enabling that to happen. So just to give an example like the SMB group, right? SMB is very different from large enterprise. There's just different challenges. Um, I think, you know, people that are in SMB need a place to communicate and collaborate together. And so from my perspective, that's a, a good um, example of how this platform is being used to kind of drive, uh, you know, relevant content and communication um, to certain groups of people. So. It's been a, a phenomenal experience so far. Walter, are you ready for us? Um, one area that Britain has been talking about that I'm actually involved with is the work group for the actual um, definition project. And I would say this has been worked very well for us from the perspective of, um, in regarding to the definition project, the first thing we put together was an actual survey to come up with what definitions we were going to start with effectively use to um, work with from when we begin the sales and enablement definition drafts. Britton, uh, tell me more about your view of uh, video uh, for sales enablement. There's a challenge um, in, in selling, uh, uh, both in, in learning, you know, we're learning internally and, and our cut, we're, we're teaching and learning in conjunction with our prospective buyers and so forth. And we're trying to accelerate those elements. And I would say an overarching issue is we're trying to overcome what, what uh, I call the trust barrier, something that will be addressed in, in greater depth in our next book, but the trust barrier. And, and something that's powerful about video, and even seeing it here is seeing us. You know, you see us, you, you, you hear us. It's different than reading text in which you really don't have context. You don't get a sense of the, the humor or, or where somebody's coming from. So many signals are missed. So in, in part of accelerating the learning, we want to capture things in media and in assets that are relevant to people. That's, that's key. And, and clearly video enables us to do that. It now enables us to capture so much information uh, I just had someone walking through a budget this week and, and I had on, you know, I, I hit record on the video and he just walked us through it. Now people who couldn't attend that meeting can just go to the asset and get up the learning curve on, on where the budget and the investment and, and so forth uh, is at and then they'll ask smarter questions. That is the, the power of video. And of course, from, a, from a, just a marketing perspective, it's clearly the thing that's resonating most. So, um, you know, video is going to be a bigger part. It's even going to be a bigger part in the Sales Enablement Society. I kind of lead the coverage desk uh, for Sales Enablement, which means I'm going to be out doing a lot of videos like this one and others where we capture the stories of what's going on. Who are, who's, where are people on their hero's journey? Um, where, where are they? What, what are they contributing? Uh, what have they experienced? What do they aspire to be? I want to see that in vivid uh, color and, and video. It humanizes everything we're doing. And that is, that's the power I see in it. So it's, it's big, 
And, you know, we got to figure out the formats that work best and how to use them, how to socialize them. But clearly, it's going to be a big part of how we connect as a, a very distributed, uh, somewhat chaotic, uh, though we embrace the chaos imperative, but as an organization, uh, how we connect and, and build and grow. I see you have a lot of passion about this, and and when you get animated, then uh, your camera actually shakes like as if <laughs> no earthquake in Austin. Yeah. Yes. Who's that maniac on the camera? <laughs> hey, Ger Gerhard, could I expand on the video? Sure. Uh, so one thing I see, you know, I believe in this world, everybody has their st strengths in content creation. And I believe salespeople are almost better than anyone when it comes to video, doing video. They like to talk, they're more comfortable in front of the camera, and they can use it to a real asset to their advantage within emails where they can effectively use that video to build that credibility and trust factor. But also sales individuals are becoming more and more with that consultative selling approach, educators, providing value with content educating based upon their core potential customers problems video can be invaluable and then of course on the other side of the table is the training component side for sales reps where they need to quickly get some information uh, based upon as example specific questions this type of persona customer is going to ask and they can quickly gather that information Awesome. So um, we need to wrap it up. Our role is is to never be finished and, and always be in permanent beta mode and always iterate. Tune in uh, next Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys. Yes, thank you all. Appreciate it.